MSNBC takes you behind the walls of America's most notorious prisons into a world of chaos and danger. Now, the scenes you've never seen. Lock up raw. At any prison, there are essentially two sets of rules. There are the rules of the administration. The other set of rules are the inmates' rules themselves, the convict code. They got their rules, we got ours. The convict code is you don't get in other people's business, you don't let nobody know your business, you don't tell on nobody. You stick with your own race, you don't talk to other people. You might steer at a person, he might consider that a sign of disrespect. Any inmate will tell you that's the set of rules you follow first. On their first morning of shooting at Utah State Prison, the lockup crew entered the Wasatch A cell block, home to some of the prison's most violent convicts. We met a group of inmates playing cards and talking about who really runs the prison. The guards here don't run your sections. Yeah, it's all run by, you know, by your inmates. Yeah, they, they pretty much tell what goes on. You know, a guard does your section, but the inmates are pretty much, they don't get along then. They're going to either force them out or they'll get moved. They'll get moved. They'll straight out get told, Chief, you get your ass down to the pot and leave it. Hit the butt. Hey, Pack your stuff and get out. Go. And that's exactly yeah, what You're welcome on the block. The guards are just in their pot, you know. They distribute all the food. They, they mean, they're only in there to make sure nothing major goes on. The other net, inmates run everything else. Sergeant Danny Herring was one of only two officers assigned to manage the 95 men on Wasatch A that morning. Yeah, they can take the block, but they're not going anywhere. What are they going to do? Um, that really doesn't bother me. It's, I, I really don't have a control issue that way. They let us control and manipulate how they live and what they do. They got their rules, we got ours. You know, There's a code of conduct in here that you got to follow if you want to you know, make your time easy, you know. You don't rat on people, you know, just all kinds of stuff, you know. You don't do That code of conduct is the convict code, and the penalties for violating it can be severe. If you look up, the fourth deck's pretty high, you know. A lot of people, people take an elevator ride, the problem is there ain't no elevator. The fall doesn't hurt them, it's a sudden stop at the end. Utah State inmate Tony Duran is well-versed in the convict code. He has spent the majority of the past 23 years behind bars for burglary, robbery, and a slew of parole violations. The convict code is a person that carries himself with respect. He doesn't, he only talks to the man when he has to. You know, he don't sit there and kick it with the man. You don't tell on nobody. You don't let nobody know your business. You don't, you don't get in other people's business. You respect yourself, you respect others around you. But these days, old-time inmates like Duran all agree the convict code is changing. Well, because the different breed of inmate that's coming to the joint now, you know? You got kids coming in here, you know? Some of them are gangbangers that don't know how to carry themselves. And some of them, they just don't give a shit about respect or nothing like that. We've discovered the proliferation of gangs at every prison we've profiled. And Utah is no exception. But nowhere are prison gangs more powerful, dangerous, and faster growing than in California. And they have added their own ominous chapters to the convict code. You can always spot a guy that's not used to prison, a new inmate, uh, because he'll come out, he'll wander around, he won't go with his own group, you know, he's just looking. And uh, usually what will happen is uh, uh, one of the gangsters will go over and snatch him up and bring him over and run the, run the game down to him. Tell him, hey, this is what you got to do. This is where you got to be. You can only hang out with your own people. We don't want to see you talking to people of other races. And uh, that happens real quick, real quick. At San Quentin State Prison, we learned that not only do gangs force most of the prison population into racial segregation, they even draw boundaries on the rec yard. Hey, this is the lower yard, and the inmates segregate themselves out here. Uh, the reason being that the gangs want it that way. The blacks are over here, the Northern Hispanics is our, our main gang here at San Quentin, and it's because they're better organized. Okay, the white guys are over here on the parallel bars and on the picnic table. Now, over in the corner, you see where the Asians are sitting. You can't just walk and sit on the table. I had to explain that. 
I'd almost gotten a confrontation with that two or three times because you know, I saw a table, I sat down. It's not like that. You gotta, you gotta ask for, for permission to sit down there. Even such a minor misstep can be taken as a sign of disrespect, and that can lead to widespread violence. Though correctional staff is constantly on the lookout for weapons, it's well known that many on this yard are armed for battle, and none more so than the Northern Hispanics. They have a minister of defense, and his thing is he's to have 10 weapons ready at any time down here on this yard. Their weapons are all hid over there, and in the morning we'll come over and we'll search that area and, and try to find their weapons but they're getting better and better at the way they hide their weapons. As you see, this one guy keeps looking around and uh, he's got the heavy coat on. The temperature's pretty hot, so they're, they're the soldiers. They wear these jackets, it's a little bit more armor. If uh, anything goes on, they're the first ones to get involved. Many inmates have told us that if violence does break out, the convict code dictates how they will respond. If it's a racial situation, you have to respond according to your, your race, racial background. You know, if I'm standing next to this man here and he's suddenly attacked by another racial group, even if I don't know him, he's black. I'm obligated by myself to assist this man. You know what I'm saying? If it's a white thing, then, you know, you get in it. If it's with the whites and another race or something, you know, then you got to be a part of it, you know. But if it's something else, I just turn my head. I don't even want to see it, you know. But we found that violence does not only occur between racially segregated rivals, Sometimes, gang violence erupts from within. I've stabbed people because of what I've had to do, you know. I can't go, you can't go against the program. At California State Prison Corcoran, we met one young inmate who was ordered to attack an older, weaker gang member, simply to thin out the herd. He asked that we not use his name. I accepted that because that's the way it is. You know, I didn't question it. You know, some things I was against, but, you know, I just dealt with it and accepted it because that's the way, that's the law of the land in here. He explained that the hit was ordered because the older victim was unable to keep up with the gang's military-style exercise program. He couldn't keep up with the exercise. You know, that was the reason. This is how stupid this is. You know, the, the dumb reasons they have in here. And when I did speak up for him, you know, it was placed on me. Well, since you're speaking up for him, then you'll deal with it. And dealt with it, because that's what it was about. The older inmate survived the stabbing, and his assailant quit the gang. Finally, I made my stance and went against it. Now I'm a Christian, and I go for that. I wrote him a letter, and I apologized, and I told him uh, that I was sorry that I had to do that. I was so weak, and I didn't, you know, protect him. I should have, you know. I was in a position to protect him, and I didn't. Next, on Lock Up Raw. It's all in a bunch of betrayals and lies. There's no loyalty, there's no honor. One gangbanger smashes the code, and another unleashes contempt for those who do. I don't know how can they wake up in the morning and see themselves in the mirror, you know? The unwritten rules that inmates live by in prison are known as the convict code. But when it comes to gangs, the convict code is the code of silence. Talking about gang business can get members killed. They got rules and we got rules within the rules. I mean, you know, among our own peoples or, or among different races, you know, but we have to deal with it. I mean, you know, I can't elaborate too much on it, you know. The subject was clearly off the table when we sat down at Pelican Bay State Prison with Raul Leon alleged to be one of the leaders of the most powerful prison gang of all, the Mexican Mafia. How uh, powerful is the Mexican Mafia here at Pelican Bay? I don't even touch on that right there. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't speak on it myself, you know? Raul Leon had such influence throughout the state by assigning individuals to represent him. He would have people assaulted, he would have riots uh, take place on his orders. Serving a life sentence for murder, Leon lives in what is widely regarded as the most restrictive environment in the state of California, Pelican Bay Security Housing Unit, or SHU. Inmates are confined to their cells for all but 90 minutes per day, 
which they're allowed to spend in a nearby concrete exercise area. Leon had been living here for 14 years when we met him. I always tell people he ain't built a prison hard enough to break me, you know? And some of us are stronger than others. And I think that's what Pelican Bay is about. Only the strongest are the ones that are gonna make it, you know? While Leon refuses to disavow loyalty to his gang, the prison sees a slow but steady flow of inmates who do. Through a process called debriefing, they not only break the code, they smash it to bits. It's basically when existing gang members want to get out of a gang inside prison. And in order to do that, there's a whole debriefing process they have to go through. And uh, it basically entails the inmate coming in and confessing everything he's done with the gang. And sometimes even, you know, throwing some people under the bus and confessing against other people. So it's, it's really a deadly thing for someone to do inside a prison. When inmates debrief, they must write a lengthy account of their criminal history both in and out of prison. The review process can take months, but if accepted, the inmates will be allowed to live in the safety of a protective custody unit and be granted many more privileges than they would have had as confirmed gang members. Because of your, um, your March 11th, 99 incident, with uh, with another inmate that you almost killed came very close to killing um, we have a question about your sincerity about debriefing lockup cameras were at California State Prison Corcoran when Thomas Spiller a longtime gang member went before the inmate review board to request a debriefing I can certainly see your point of view however um a good many of these inmates that are in the IYP program have, have in fact been in my position in the past and, um, and have also called hits on other inmates and, and, and actually done hits themselves. So I'm assuming that you have had the same concerns about them or, or am I being singled out for some it's really, reason? You know, let's not go there. You're going to be given an opportunity to debrief. You know, she's only giving you the honest truth and the truth is there's concern it also depends on how sincere you are when you do your your history statement all the stuff that you just told us about order, ordering hits that kind of thing yeah. you're gonna have to do that you're gonna put that to writing Ms. Billy, yes I just for my own understanding what is the main source of your change of heart basically I'm I'm tired of doing other people's dirty work of ordering people to do things that because for for um, someone else's selfish reasons when in fact it, it doesn't benefit me here nor there that I was ordered to um, to kill a dear friend of mine and uh, I really didn't appreciate that good enough for me there's no guarantees so it really has to come from within the inmate of him wanting to change who he is and uh, it was interesting to see these guys do this and put themselves through this process knowing that you know they're they're dead men walking for now spiller will stay in a transitional housing unit with other inmates who are also in the debriefing process all men that raul leon despises i don't know how can they wake up in the morning and see themselves in the mirror you know whatever excuse you use to get to the transitional housing unit uh to me it's just a crock of it's just a scam it's it's Individuals just trying to play the, the the last card they have, saying, hey, you know what? I got to get out of here. The only thing good about them debriefers and rats is that they can never return back to their neighborhoods. They're ostracized. Leon's anger is aimed at men like Miguel Perez, once a high-ranking member of the Mexican mafia himself. Perez had already left the gang several years before we met him, and he's not looked back. As for what soured myself on the gang life, in all honesty, is I opened my eyes to see it for what it is. It's all a bunch of betrayals and lies. There's no loyalty. There's no honor. There's no respect. I've seen too many, too many innocent people being targeted that had nothing to do with the gang life. Just because one of their family members were a part of it, you ain't supposed to target innocent people. But Perez left us with a piece of advice for any inmate thinking about joining a gang. My word of advice to him is to remember two things. One, that he's not in control of his life. Because as long as he's a part of this game, 
there's someone he has to answer to. Whether he believes he's his own man, that's a myth. Because someone's running his program. So he could walk around with his head puffed up, his chest out and everything, and think that he's really badass. But he's going to follow orders just like anyone else. For every badass, there's someone badass. Coming up on Lock Up Raw. I am a man that is attracted to young women. God forbid, 99% of us are. How the convict code applies to sex offenders. On mainline, they walk around and they slide a knife under your door. Here, kill your celly or we kill you when you come out. In every prison profiled on lockup, our producers have found subtle differences in how inmates enforce the convict code or the unwritten rules by which they live. But one aspect rarely changes, the position of sex offenders on the inmate hierarchy. Murderers, robbers, they're up here. Child molesters, rapists, they're down here. Them guys on the bottom deck, most of them guys are sex offenders. You know? I don't like them, I just tolerate them. I used to beat up all these sex offenders. I used to prey on them. They normally mark the sexual predators by cutting them across the face with a razor blade or a knife, and, and that's just a lot. The other inmates know that, hey, this guy no good. They call him trash. We even met a pair of brothers who wouldn't hesitate to extend the convict code to their own father. My father was in here for, uh, I don't know the exact charge, but he was in here for messing with kids. And, you know, I ain't cool with that. Brad and Michael Love are serving time for murder at Anamosa State Penitentiary in Iowa. I was never incarcerated with him. When I found out that he was getting incarcerated, what he did time for, what he got charged for, they asked me if there would be any problems if we were in the same prison. I told him, yeah, I probably ended up killing him. I just, I cannot condone that. Lockup has profiled plenty of inmates who spew hatred towards sex offenders. But we've also introduced viewers to those on the receiving end. Thomas Headley is serving a 15-year sentence at Utah State Prison. And like many sex offenders, says his punishment is unjust and his crime misunderstood. I was charged with kidnapping somebody that was under 14. I am a man that is attracted to young women. God forbid, 99% of us are. When we interviewed him, Headley was serving his time in solitary confinement as a punishment for being uncooperative. But he explained to us that he had his own motives for being in the hole. There's not a safer place anywhere in the prison than where I'm at. No matter what you do, no matter how you try to approach it, you are a worthless piece of crap because you are a sex offender. You're a useless mole. That's all, that's the way everybody talks to you in here. Oh, you're a mole, huh? Molester. You're one of those. But I have seen guys get stabbed. I saw a guy get a piece of a shovel handle stuck right in the side of his neck. And I've seen a guy get a hammer took to him and just beat the side of his head to a wreck. I've got a safety list that's got at least 20 names on it with people that told me in no uncertain terms, you're a dead man if we ever get our hands on you. On the main line, they, I'd be dead in a day. Because they, those guys over there, they just wouldn't care. They, they would kill me right in front of an officer because it's a notch on their belt. We met Earl Heimer at California's Kern Valley State Prison. I have a 37-year sentence. Lewd acts on a minor, 14 years old. This was not Heimer's first time in prison, nor his first sex offense. My wife deemed it necessary that I be arrested for uh, attempted rape of your wife. You know, of a, as weird as that sounds, that uh, you come home drunk and try and take it and she doesn't want it, that's still a uh, criminal offense. Heimer lives in the prison's protective custody wing. Ironically, during his first prison term, he was one of the inmates who targeted sex offenders. You know, I've participated in helping hunt for child molesters. You know, well, this guy said, oh, he's a child molester, and this is a child molester, and you catch him out in the yard, and you go through his stuff and look, read his paperwork and see what he's really here for. You 
you know, then yes, he is, or no, he's not. Well, generally, um, somebody will catch him in a day room or TV room or whatever and punch him in the mouth, tell him to roll it up now. And if he blinks twice or hesitate just a little bit, like I was saying a minute ago, if you sit down and you're trying, well, wait a minute, let me explain. Too late. Now you're beat up, stabbed, whatever. They take it to the next level immediately. Heimer shares a cell with another convicted child molester, Ray Rowe, who is serving a 230-year sentence. Even though he is in protective custody, Rowe rarely leaves his cell out of fear for his safety. I don't know whether someone's going to try to take me out before the day's over with. Every time I go to chow, every time any sex offender goes to chow, or goes out of their cell, and sometimes even in your cell, can I go to sleep with this person in here? You're pretty vulnerable when you're sound asleep. Heimer and Rowe have worked out an uneasy trust, if not a friendship. We managed to either read or watch TV or stay out of each other's way. Yeah, you draw. Yeah. Uh, we can draw. I, do, I draw in the afternoon sometimes. Uh, and generally, like he said, we watch TV. Uh, he got the television and kind enough that I go watch it just as much or more than he does. For me, with this much time, it's safer to be in there with a, with a guy with the same charge. I can sleep at night. I don't have to worry about this guy going to cut my throat. On mainline, they walk around and they slide a knife under your door. Here, kill your cell here, or we kill you when you come out. And that sounds like, oh yeah, that's a movie. No, that's a fact. Still, Heimer has mixed feelings about sharing a cell with someone just like himself. My cell uh, is really a multiple offender. As bad as that sits in my gut like uh, acid, uh, I just... It's, it, it's just a putrid thing that there's nothing sexy about a kid. You know what I mean? And to hear it, to know it, I know I'm here for it. That charge. But it's just still sickening. Next on Lock Up Bra. I want to go home with her. Yeah. I'm taking this in home to the country. The convict code takes on a new dimension when the inmates are women. We call bulldagging what we call a women relationship here. It's a slang word for bulldagging, and that's two women together. The vast majority of prisons we visited over the years have been male institutions. But when we've taken our cameras inside women's prisons, we've met inmates living by a very different convict code. The biggest difference between male and female inmates and how they get along with each other is basically looked at in two ways. One, male inmates tend to find gangs to get involved with. It's their kind of security blanket and protection. On the other hand, females find it through um, interpersonal relationships. Uh, there's much more drama, there's much more bonding in the sense of you know, establishing kind of almost marriages. We found that to be the case when we visited the North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women. Because in here, there's so many people against us in here, it's hard to find somebody that's, that's with you, that's going to that's have your back in this institution, just like somebody would have their back, your back on the street. And that friendship usually will turn into something more. Women like women, men like men, oh well. <laughs> I want to go home with her. Yeah, I'm taking this in home to the country. Let that be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's just love, just like, just like marriage. Right. Same thing. It's different. It's more complicated. It's hard to find somebody in here, though, that'll keep it real, real, real with like you. A lot of women in here messing up. They lie on you. Yeah. Oh. Ladies, y'all put some space in between y'all. Physical intimacy is against the rules. But during our shoot here, we met one of our more memorable inmates, and she made no secret of her active sex life. My nickname is Heavy D, and why I have it is because my middle name is Dawn, and I'm just heavy, so they just call me Heavy D. And they call me the weight lover Heavy D, so I just stuck with it. Heavy D is 37-year-old Pamela Braswell. When we met her, she was serving her seventh prison term, this time for DUI. I'm not very good at obeying rules. I try, but I have a very smart mouth on me. What they gonna do, lock me up? <laughs> <laughs> 
It's the only activity we have on the weekends besides bulldogging. <laughs> we call bulldogging what we call a women relationship here. It's a slang word for bulldogging. That's two women together. <laughs> this is the bulldogging crew. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that? Well, no one watching this girl. She's a French teacher. I have a girlfriend here, but uh, I don't, uh, I have several girlfriends. She's just not my special girlfriend. I have two or three girlfriends. Who's that? Teresa. Who is it? It's my wife. What? Yeah. I've been with my wife about three and a half years. Is it working? No. No, but she knows I'm a player. I gotta do what I gotta do to survive in prison. And Heavy D is always looking to add new arrivals to her brood. You know, you got some that's gay like me that come off the streets that's really gay, and, and then we have some in here that just haven't been with women and curious and want to try it, so they get mixed up in here. Nine times out of ten, they get turned out. And that means they, a woman turns them out. That means they have sex with a woman and they end up getting turned out. What's okay. turning out mean? <laughs> turning out means they get a whole woman, they get lonely, as soon as they do the damn thing, they, it's all she wrote. <laughs> and I'm being for real. Yeah, they just and then they get stupid. You wasn't gay for you to come in here, though, was you? Nope. Other women at North Carolina built committed monogamous relationships. But those relationships still clash with prison policy. We have situations where inmates begin to value one another more than they do following the directives of the authorities here. They are a, a security issue. No! The first time lockup cameras rolled tape on North Carolina inmate Jennifer Porter, she was trying to get a glimpse of her girlfriend and fellow inmate, Danica Cox, out on the prison yard. At the time, Jennifer was restricted to a solitary confinement cell as punishment for fighting with another inmate. But she and Danica were already deeply involved when they shared their story with us. We've got a really strong bond, you know. I mean, it ain't all about sex. It's a real marriage of the heart for us. You know, it may not be um, lawful or, you know, but it's, to us, it's real. At the time of the shoot, Jennifer's confinement prohibited any contact with Danica. Their feelings about being separated for the past 10 days were palpable. I was writing her last night. Um, I said, hey, sexy lady, um, girl, you drive me crazy. How have I been spending my days? <laughs> crying. <laughs> Looking at a picture, crying. And I said, I feel so dead inside without you. And I said, my eyes don't shine. I said, my eyes don't shine and everything looks so great. Today was the first day I've smiled, and that was because I've seen her throw a crack at the top of a window. The only chance they have of being reunited soon is if Jennifer's fighting charge is dropped or reduced at her disciplinary hearing. The outcome could be the difference between seeing Danica within a matter of hours or months. So the SC's read you your rights on March 15th. You understand your rights? Okay. So I'm going to charge you with the C4. I'm going to dismiss the C3 because the officer said when she gave you the directive to stop, you did stop, okay? How do you plea? Guilty. Jennifer's guilty plea on the lesser of the two charges means she will be out of solitary in 12 days, sooner than she thought. Oh, my God, Mr. Campbell, did you see Danica outside? Anxious to see Danica, Jennifer starts to inquire about her to the lockup crew. Did you see Danica outside? I'm not even here. Meanwhile, a second lockup camera is located Danica, now waiting outside. Don't get up the pants, you can. You can ask, but, you know. I mean, I don't know. We're not allowed to say anything. Sorry. Oh, they playing mind games. I don't understand why they're not allowed to say anything. I'm flipping. Back inside, as Jennifer gets ready to leave, she is about to risk everything by arguing with the correctional officer. Uh, she'll be escorted up to segregation to serve her days up there in single cell A. Why do you look so eager? I'm ready to get outside. Why? Fresh air, fresh air. 
could have been outside. You could have been staying outside, you know? You could have been out on the ground, not in SEG, if you hadn't been caught up in this. Oh, my jeez. Didn't we just go through this and why I did that? Okay, so why I keep... Okay, but I'm simply saying, if somebody rolled up on you and punched you in your nose, you ain't gonna do You can't sit there and say you wouldn't, Mr. Wright. And if you are, if you would, you're lying. If this man right here come up here and punched you in your nose, you seen blood, you're gonna sit there and say, well, let me call the police. You just stand right there, okay? Hell no, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna go to somebody's ass if they punch you in your nose and you see your nose bleed. If you mind in your business, okay, and that's what I felt like I had to do. Finally, as Jennifer is escorted out of the building, her hopes of seeing Danica seem like they're about to come true. The grounds are now restricted. The grounds are now restricted. Or unassigned inmates report to your dorm. But with the yard shut down for the day, Jennifer can only call out to Danica's cell block in hopes that she might be seen or heard. I love you! The future of any prison relationship is uncertain, and especially so for Jennifer and Danica. Jennifer, serving time for drug offenses, was due to be released within a matter of months. Danica, in for robbery, was still facing three to five more years. We plan to be together for the rest of our life. Those are our plans. I'm going to stick by her, no doubt. It may sound crazy, but I'll probably end up even coming back. The reality is that she could come back here to be with me. Oh get another charge. A lot of people here can't deal with rejection, especially coming from uh, transsexual. A place in the code for gays and gay predators. Attitudes towards sex in male penitentiaries are complex. According to the convict code, child molesters and rapists are reviled. But homosexuals can live freely in prison as long as they adhere to other parts of the code. Mind your own business and never show weakness. Well, the boys seem to have no problem with it. They love us. I mean, we're like gold in here. We really are. I mean, it's very few of us. Oh, please, maybe not for you. But anyway, I mean, they treat us just like they treat anybody else. You know what I mean? As long as we give them their respect and don't cross those boundaries, we will get treated just like anybody else. At California State Prison Corcoran, we met three inmates living openly as homosexuals at what is considered one of the toughest and most violent prisons in the state. Okay, uh, if you could just state and spell your name for us. Um, Regina Maiden, well, Ashley Reginald Maiden, R-E-G-I-N-A-L-D, M-A-I-D-E-N. In this raw interview footage, the three men discuss the possibility of attack and how they would respond. It's not being attacked, it's just being like, in a proper word, is stalked, just yeah. harassed, just because of rejection. You know, a lot of people here can't deal with rejection, especially coming from a transsexual. A lot of other things people don't realize. We're men just like them. We're just feminine like them. And don't forget, women do kill. Yeah, okay. And it's like a lot of us don't put up with that, and a lot of guys know that, and a lot of guys don't. So you know, when the ones don't. They end up getting like bears, lady with their chorus and beat up, play. you know, and it makes them look bad on the yard. So that's why a lot of people do give homosexuals to respect sometimes, because they don't know what we're capable of doing. Some gay inmates embrace their feminine side. But when lockup visited Kentucky State Penitentiary, we met Fleece Johnson, a longtime inmate who practices a very different kind of homosexuality. But we have sexual desires, right? So you got a bunch of men locked up in one place. All of them get hard. All of them's horny. All of them got sexual desires. So what are they going to do? You won't let them have a woman. They're going to have each other. Somebody's going to have to give us some booty. And it's just that simple. <laughs> the most uh, memorable story that Fleece told us was about the place and importance that 
Booty has in a maximum security penitentiary. And he went on about it and on about it. In his prison, Booty. Booty was uh, more important than food. Booty, a man's butt. It was more important, <laughs> I'm sorry. It was more booty, having some booty, was more important than drinking water, man. I like booty. Johnson went on to tell our crew how he used to satisfy his sexual desires, especially during the 1970s and 80s, when he was most active and prison security was more lax. When I see one, and he looks good to me, when I go see him, I say, you come here. I say, I'm telling you what, uh, I like you, and I want you. And uh, uh, we can do it the easy way out of the hallway. So the choice is yours, right? And it was always yes. Johnson also had a warning for the new generation of inmates. They might be asking for trouble from old timers. You know, they got this thing where they sag their pants, past their butt. It's a style, they call it some sort of gangster style. You know, it's sexy to us, right? And see, but they weren't prepared for this, right? So you sag your pants in her, man, somebody be up in your butt, you know? And it's just that simple. Johnson even let the lockup crew know that when he was in his prime, they wouldn't be safe from his advances either. If y'all had been in her back then in them days, and as much as I like booty, I probably felt one of y'all butts as y'all was walking past me and dared you to say something. I'm not no shame in my game. This is nothing that I'm ashamed to admit. I am what I am. I'm a warrior too. You know, so let that be known. I'm a warrior. Coming up on Lock Up Bra. I was uh, convicted of four counts of first degree murder. Um, my children. How the code extends to the loneliest place in prison death row. with a death sentence. Rules of any kind might seem irrelevant. But a chapter of the convict code even extends to death row. A place lockup has visited many times. There's an unmistakable feeling when you walk onto uh, a death row at a prison. Um, everywhere else in the prison is alive with bustle, with noise. They're loud places. When you walk on death row, it's completely silent. It is eerily silent. Randy Height, convicted of double murder and armed robbery, has been on death row at Kentucky State Penitentiary since 1995. We have one of the most well-behaved units in the institution. Well, you can't say that we ain't got nothing to lose. We've got plenty to lose, you know. Uh, we have uh, whatever privileges we do have, you know, that can be wiped away in a heartbeat. But that's not the only reason death row inmates are often the best behaved. Their basic behavior is directly related to them being able to say in their clemency plea that we were good guys while we were there. We didn't, we didn't create uh, havoc, we weren't violent, we weren't all of these things, and try to obviously portray the good things that they've done while they've been incarcerated. I have a hope that one day that I can be out of prison, you know? Uh, even though that hope might be small, I know that what I've done was wrong. I deserve to be where I'm at. I've accepted uh, whatever might come. What the future holds for Height is not yet certain. His case is still on appeal. But one day, he might take the same walk our lockup crew took when they shot at Kentucky State. Kentucky is one of the states that actually still has an electric chair. And I had asked Warden Haberlin, you know, we want to make sure that we get a shot of, of the electric chair. So we go to the end of the corridor in Three Cell House where, where they keep the execution chamber. And I remember he opened the door 
and there was old Sparky. And it was unforgettable. This is the electric chair which is maintained by the Kentucky State Penitentiary in order to complete executions by electrocution. It was originally built somewhere in the 1900s. It's just leather and wood and metal, like any other chair. But there's this unmistakable feeling. You know people die there. Some of Kentucky's death row inmates can choose between the electric chair and lethal injection. That's also the case in the neighboring state of Tennessee. And when we visited there, we met a death row inmate who soon would face that decision. And as far as Daryl Holton was concerned, the sooner the better. I was uh, convicted of four counts of first degree murder. Um, my children. Throughout the entire interview, Holton spoke in a calm, coherent manner about what led to his nightmarish actions. Got out of the army. Divorced my wife, had custody of my children. Reconciled with my wife, the reconciliation didn't work. And I hit her, I struck her. Um, she got custody of the children and pretty much factored me out of the picture. Then, on November 30th, 1997, Holton picked up his four children, ranging in age from four to 12, to take them Christmas shopping. Instead, he shot each one through the heart. I miss them, but, but no, I can't say that I fell in. While many death row inmates filed numerous appeals to delay their execution, Holton dropped all of his. I do think that the death penalty is appropriate in some cases. And I've got a low tolerance for someone claiming that they didn't do something that they actually did. There was no factual dispute about what happened. There was none. It wasn't a question of who did it. There's no doubt. I'm not going to sell out. I'm not going to change my views on the death penalty just because I'm facing the death penalty. Holton was not only ready to face his death sentence, he had chosen to have it carried out in the electric chair. But to his dismay, he had seen his execution date come and go more than once. Well, supposedly they were serious about executing me last year. And supposedly they're serious about executing me this year. Um, if the past is any indication, I don't think they're very serious. And that's not bravado. Um, it's, more, it's more an issue of integrity. A deal's a deal. Back at Kentucky State Penitentiary, Randy Height made it clear he's not as eager to face death as Holton, but he's ready for it. Nonetheless, I'm extremely sad for what I've done. It, it hurts me knowing that I went to the level that I went. Uh, and if there was any way possible for me to uh, be healed or, or corrected, believe me, it would be, it, it would be done. Uh, it, it's an impossible situation, not only for me, but for everybody involved. You know. Uh, and I'm not saying that they're to get out of an execution or because, or, or, like I said, I'm ready. If you want to kill me, let's go. I'm ready to go. Uh, but I think that I have something I can offer somebody. And I don't think it's really time for me to die. 